Today I'm tearing down this hybrid Civic engine to see what's inside and how it works. Now Honda has integrated motor assist which literally means that there's an electric motor integrated on the crankshaft and I need to remove it before I can mount it on the engine stand. I'm just going to first remove these 14s for the flywheel. Now I can unbolt the rotor. Turns out you could just pop this off as a separate piece. I guess we'll look at that in the hybrid video. They say after winning an argument with your wife, the next most difficult thing in life is a Honda crank bolt. So I've got this special tool on there with the 19. Let's see if I can get this one free. Holy, gonna need the pipe for this one. Yes, it moved. Here we have a 1.5 liter engine. Now it looks like a V8 because we've got eight ignition coils and spark plugs. Furthermore, we've got some solenoids that bolt up to the head and a plastic inlet manifold with an integrated EGR setup. Around the back here, we do have a mechanical water pump as well as an integrated exhaust manifold like most Hondas. And just behind the throttle body, we do have a coolant manifold. So I'm gonna start this chair down by removing all the ignition connectors. As you can see, these ones are sturdy and they don't break unlike Toyotas. I will buzz off these uh, ignition coils. Can you imagine changing eight ignition coils and spark plugs? It's like the maintenance of a V8 engine with the economy of a two cylinder. Gotta brush the crusties off of these bolts. Carefully disconnect it. Be sure you don't damage it. And now I should be able to take out all the bolts for the valve cover. Now the spark plugs have tube seals on one side and they're integrated into the valve cover gasket for the other side. Now here's where we come to the most interesting part and these two solenoids here which look like they've got a VTEC setup under here in fact is not VTEC. It's going to close off all of the valves when the IMA motor is kicking in and that's going to turn the crankshaft with all the valves closed. That allows the vehicle to take off at very slow speeds with the gasoline engine shut off so you can save fuel. Now I'm just gonna remove this engine harness here by removing the four from the injectors and some bolts back here, BRB. Gotta use my dad's toothbrush again to clean off more connectors. The fuel rail off. I'm gonna smell pretty flammable tonight, if you get what I mean. Now as you can see, we've got the port injectors that inject fuel into the air stream before it goes into the head. I turn the engine on the side here so I can get a better access to the air intake. Just going to gently remove these hoses, which are worth a lot of money. All right, now we can pull off the air intake. This is a plastic unit. Now looking down inside the throttle body, it does look pretty nasty. All right, over on this side, we have the very familiar Honda style EGR. This is reached by a 12 millimeter socket. And here we have the infamous EGR. Now these EGRs are always known to carb up an older Honda. That's because it's got to control a lot of hot exhaust gases that come back from the exhaust side and get reburned into the intake. And of course that's for emissions, more so for this being a hybrid. So make sure you check the link above on how to service this and how it works. Now there's no dedicated exhaust gas recirculation cooler on here. As a matter of fact, they just pump in coolant into this part of the intake over here so the exhaust gas is kind of passed by there and get cooled off kind of a cheaper solution but it works it doesn't leak i'm going to remove these tens that's where all the exhaust gases run and just as i said there's a lot of soot built up inside of here and that tends to clog these things up now that coolant is going to flow down inside this intake back around to this hose here which connects to the back of the water pump i hate how honda makes you use a wrench to get into these bolts because they're too tight to put a socket directly on it's just a 12 mil bolt all right we got a what is that, a knock sensor? This would be a knock sensor. It would be another sensor, probably a coolant temperature sensor. That allows us to remove the wiring harness from the rest of the vehicle. And here we have a coolant tube that goes to this coolant plate. We'll just remove that nicely. And the other coolant tube that comes from the EGR. And we'll pull this intake off. And there you can have it. You'll see the coolant path that goes from that one tube on the back straight to the tube on the water pump. And over here, this tube looks like a venting tube. And inside of here, you can see there's tiny little holes that bring that EGR straight into the runner before it goes into here to clog up your valves. I'm gonna pop off this intake gasket. The intake valves look pretty clean inside of there. I guess these port injectors are doing their job of washing off the back of those valves. I'm gonna remove the solenoid that controls the VCM system. Oh, there's oil. Looks just like a VTEC gasket. Let's see, there is a little screen on there. I don't see any particles in the screen. This was a running car, by the way, 269,000 kilometers, but 
it ran pretty poorly. Now I said VCM because it does do cylinder management. Instead, it actually shuts off all of the cylinders when you're in electric only mode by redirecting oil through these two oil control solenoids over here, the same way VTEC would to this contraption on top. Next, I'm going to work on the water pump. Now it's driven off the crankshaft as well as a hybrid AC compressor. Make sure you stay tuned if you want to see me tear down that. And there's just a tensioner. There's no alternator or any other accessories on this engine. Water pump's a tiny little D-shape, uh, kind of reminds me of something. Let me see if my dad Milwaukee can take off this tensioner. Old style tensioner. Now if I move to the back side of the head here, I do have the coolant manifold. Alright, taking a look inside this coolant manifold, you can see we've obviously got our two radiator hoses that go out to the front. We have a traditional style thermostat, this is before they went digital, especially on these hybrids. And then at the back here, these two smaller tubes go to the heater core. Again, that's before we had electric heating. Let's just pull this guy off here. Now these coolant crossover pipe come from the water pump itself. It doesn't actually pump directly into the block. Very typical of these older Honda engines. There's actually a little bleeder valve over here because this is the highest point in the cooling system of the engine when the vehicle is installed. Lastly, let's get this little plate off. All right, and here you can see the baffles for the PCV system. Essentially, we've got sludgy air at the bottom of the crankcase. It's gonna make its way up through this maze over here and then come through this port and then come through this port to the hose that goes to the air intake so you can reburn those oily vapors and clog up your intake. Taking a look at how this VTEC system works, this is more like cylinder deactivation. Essentially, we've got the old rocker arms that we always do on each valve and that's gonna go to a lost motion system inside of here. We do have the single overhead camshaft over here and that's going to shut off these valves so no air moves in and out while you're in IMA hybrid mode. Let's pop off this plate to see if we can get a closer look. It's so loud. Alright, so if I pull off this little plate here. Now a couple of these springs kind of popped off. They sort of just sit right inside of here and press up over here on this tab. Alright, I'm going to work on getting this timing cover off. Now I can get the crank pulley off here. So easy. You gotta get this engine mount out of the way. Ew. Let's start removing the timing cover itself. Beep. And now I think we got a couple of tents. Daddy. Daddy. Let's see if we can pop this off. Proper. Timing cover is actually pretty interesting. It's got a lot of webs inside of here because it's a structural piece. It does hold up the engine after all. Pretty cool inside of these L-series engines. Now this one has a trigger wheel which is made of plastic, kind of old school for that crank position sensor that sat here. But even more so, the timing chain tensioner, there is none. It's just these two bolts here that kind of hold this leaf spring in place. That's backed by a slide, which is what the chain rides up against. Let me just break this free real quick. You know it's going to get serious when it starts getting dark and rainy and you got to bust out the lights. The oil pump itself is direct drive so there's no extra chain for it and it just sits on top of the block and the crankshaft. Got some tens here to get it apart and just like that you can see the springiness of that leaf spring is what's keeping this thing in tension. Very old school and very simple. There's no hydraulic fluid needed here. Take off this slide. This, off. this one's actually backed by metal which is good. Gear, very simple, flat gear. There is a windrow key over here. Got a little six mil hex for this uh, tensioner. Pretty cool uh, spring design there. Don't you love it when things are simple? The head bolts are a very simple 12 millimeter hex socket because it's a Honda. It's very easy. No special tools. All right, I'm going to remove the head now. Well, I got some sleep and we're going to take a look at this engine here, which you can see has a completely open deck design. There's no reinforcements and it doesn't have to be. It's a hybrid. Unlike the newer L15s that have a slit in between here that allows the coolant to share from side to side for even cooling around the cylinder, this doesn't have that. So it won't suffer from head gasket blows because that's a very thin region. Piston tops have a little bit of carbon, but that's typical for a mid to high mileage engine. Taking a look under the head here, there's no breaches in the head gasket. Now, unlike other L15 engines, this one only has two valves per cylinder this is the intake and the smaller one is the exhaust and it has two spark plugs and that's to help to give a cleaner burn because this is a hybrid engine most engines from this family have two intake and two exhaust because that maximizes the amount of air that you can get through this little circle over here and underneath here we've got coolant that's going to circulate around the head to keep it nice and cool with the outlet over here and this is the oil feed tube that goes into the VTEC system up here. Alright, let's turn this engine over, make some mess. Now this car was in rough shape and you could tell by having a Fram filter on there, nobody really cared for it. 
but it did part out pretty well. It's a Civic after all. Alright, the oil pan is aluminum, which is great, but it also means when you get an impact like this, it's going to crack. Don't worry, I cracked this one when I was taking it apart. You know what I need? A pocket for my toothbrush, just like how you guys have those pocket screwdrivers. Looking at the oil pan and this bright sun here, I don't see any sparkles. A little bit of oil at the bottom, which is to be expected, and no crusties. Here you can see the two oil tubes that are going to travel to and from the oil filter inside of here. This engine is a little unique where it just goes oil pan straight to the block. There's no upper oil pan. It just has this cradle that's bolted to the block directly. Here we have the oil pickup tube. Everything's made of metal. Nothing interesting in here is the trigger wheel. Kind of made of metal? No, it's made of plastic. The die cast metal. Pull off this gear here for the oil pump. Once again, it is held in by that windrow key. So pull this off here, 10 mils. Okay. As you can see, this is directly driven from the crankshaft, which is nice and old school. You don't need a chain to drive it separately over in the corner. This is the oil pressure regulator. We've got our inlet over at the top here from the oil pickup tube and the outlet here that goes into the engine block. 14 millimeter bolts, very simple. No special tools here because it's a Honda. Ah yes, that smell when you crack these main cap bolts. The smell of like burnt engine oil kind of. This engine barely produces 150 horsepower, if that. It only has two bolts for each main cap. So there's no cross bolting, there's no extra bolts. Pop off this here. Main bearings are looking fine. This is where your rear main seal would be. And if it's leaking, you gotta pull it off with a seal puller. Ooh, this one feels very stiff and crusty. These engines are so small, they're only 1.5 liter, and they're using 8 millimeter 12 point sockets for these connecting rod caps. Amazing. And all I have that fits that is this wrench. So I hope it holds up for me to break this free. Look at these connecting rod bearings, they're absolutely clean. Honda really makes some pretty strong engines, well, at least they used to until they got to the turbo model. Alright, let's make some mess. Now this engine's been out of the car for a good five months or so, but the wrist pins are like... I also see there's a lot of carbon built up inside of the oil control rings there. And that's because these are using 0W20 weight oil with low tension rings, which means that you don't have much space inside of there for the oil to scrape back down and go down into the sump, and then it gets carved up inside of here. These are tiny little pistons. Probably make a good toy for my kids uh, if it wasn't made of sharp metal. Take off this little crank. Oh, it's so cute. This could make a good weight for my son to start lifting. All the crank journals look in good shape as well. There's no damage on there. Regardless, the thing had a fram filter. Who knows if the guys changed the oil before it, but hey, it's actually still in pretty good shape. So now that we're down to the bare block, let's take a quick look at how the lubrication system works. Now, if you remember, the oil pump bolted up to here, so that means oil is going to send its way down into the block through this galley over here and get sent out to this hole. That oil pan that bolted up to here is going to have the filter on it. That's going to filter it out and send it back out through this hole over here where it's going to run along this galley along the length of the block. Now this is a cheaper engine so we don't have oil spares that would normally tap off of this oil galley but we do have the main bearings that will tap off that oil galley and that will lubricate the crankshafts, main bearings and connecting rod bearings. We still have to lubricate and cool those piston walls and that's where it takes some of that oil from inside the connecting rod here and squirts it through this little squirter over here and that's what's going to spray up against the walls so you can lubricate it as this thing is moving up and down. Now also off of that main oil galley we have this oil pressure system sensor and teeing off of that we have the hole that's going to bring oil to the head. Now on the head the oiling system is a little unique. We have one hole here which is going to feed the camshaft to lubricate it and then we've got another hole on this side here which is going to feed the cylinder deactivation VTEC system. Now that oil is going to arrive over here at the spool valve and that's where I'm going to take this apart for the four of you that have probably reached the end of this video. Take off this little bracket looking thing here. Now normally these solenoids would pop out. Of course there's another gasket that's probably going to leak. Oh, maybe. One oil control solenoid, another oil control solenoid, and here's the housing. Quite an interesting machine piece from an engineering perspective. Now, if you look inside of there, you can see the spool valve is going to move back and forth. That's going to redirect oil to these ports over here, which are going to go into the head to command the cylinders to turn off. Now, let's take apart this VTEC system. Let's take off this little VTEC system here. And then we've got the camshaft. Actually, this is kind of unique. Because in some Hondas, you have to slide the camshaft out. On this one, you could just take it out straight. All right, I caved. I finally got a shirt. I'm going to just wipe this down. Before this was a very clean video, and I didn't need no shirt. So taking a look at this three-stage VTEC system, at the camshaft here, we've got the exhaust camshaft. And that has a normal lobe on it. And then right next to it, we have a zero lift cam. That's when the vehicle is in idle stop mode. On the intake side, we have a larger cam lobe and a smaller cam lobe. And the 
lift is ever so slightly smaller. I can barely feel it with my fingers. And then in the middle there, we have another zero lift lobe. Now during idle stop mode, when the engine is off, the valves are actually gonna ride up on these zero lift lobes because you wanna minimize pumping losses from the piston moving up and down. And that's actually gonna lock these cylinders shut so no air comes in through the intake or escapes through the exhaust. Taking a look at how the valve train behaves during the acceleration of this vehicle. Now, of course, we're at idle stop. We're gonna start with the IMA motor by itself and we'll start off with a low cam lift for moderate acceleration. Now, as soon as you lift your foot off the gas here, we're gonna be coasting on the IMA motor by itself. So the valves are gonna lock off. Now, as we start to get to a steeper and steeper hill, we're gonna need more engine power and we're gonna go from low lift to a high lift situation. Now, at the top of the hill, we start to coast and come back down. The engine is gonna shut off again and we're gonna be moving into regenerative braking as we're going down that hill to recharge that battery. So if you take a look at how this works on the rocker shaft assembly, we're moving that here. We have two ports and that's what's going to bring in oil from that VTEC solenoid that sits on the front of the head over here. Now this has two solenoids on it but it's also got two oil pressure switches and that's because you've got two separate oil circuits going on. Now that oil is going to correlate to two separate holes on this head block over here which are going to feed into the rocker shaft assembly. Now if we started the exhaust valve here you can see we've got the rocker for it. This is the side that presses down on the valve itself and on this side here we have another rocker arm with a roller on it that's going to press down on the camshaft's normal profile. Now normally these two rocker arms are locked together through spring pressure. However, when you apply some oil pressure through here, that spring is going to unlock these two arms. Now this arm here is still going to be riding up against the tall camshaft profile and it's got its own little spring back here that it's going to bounce up on, but it can no longer transmit power to this rocker arm. This rocker arm is pressing up against the valve spring, keeping it shut, while the back of it here is just riding up against the zero cam profile on the camshaft. That valve therefore stays closed and you minimize pumping losses. Now on the intake side here, remember we've got three rocker arms. This middle one here is the one that presses up against the valve, always pushing it down. Now the back side of it always grazes against the low cam lobe over here for your idle stop. Now as a fail safe, you have these little caps with pistons in between here that will lock these two cam profiles together so you're at least always riding on the low cam lobe. I mean if that wasn't a fail safe then technically your engine wouldn't start as the intake valve wouldn't move. Now when you apply oil pressure that's going to push this piston back in so these can rock separately from each other. Now this roller arm here is still going to roll on the low cam profile. It's got its own spring over there so it's going to rock back and forth and this one's going to roll on the flat cam lobe so this valve doesn't move. Now the interesting is for the high cam lobe you've also got a separate oil circuit inside of this roller arm shaft and that's going to plug in inside of here and lock this cam lobe with the valve one over here so these will rock together at a much higher rate. Separate circuits you ask? Well let's take this apart. Take a look inside here you can see there's a hole drilled on the left side and one drilled on the bottom and there are two separate depths over here correlating to these two separate holes. And the rocker arm shaft has a hole up at the top here and one 90 degrees apart corresponding to two separate oil circuits inside this tube. So essentially the three modes are if there's no oil pressure the springs are going to connect here and that's just going to give you a regular cam lobe for so your low side on the intake and the regular one on the exhaust. If you apply oil pressure in one circuit it's going to relax that and give you idle stop mode in both exhaust and intake for no lift. And on the final circuit it's going to apply oil pressure to give you higher intake lift. So in essence it is kind of a VTEC system them because you do have a higher cam profile and if you take a look at the head you can see there's those two holes that correlate over here on the head and those are going to be directed by the spool valve and that's a look at the honda civic hybrids engine and how it works make sure you support me on patreon and subscribe if you want to see more teardowns just like this one